<clears throat> Turn with me to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Why Jesus came. Why Jesus came. Romans chapter 3. As you turn there, I'm going to read Psalm chapter 53 and verse 2. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did seek God. Every one of them is gone back. They are altogether become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Who did Jesus come for? Who did Jesus come for? Our text there in Romans 3 and verse 10 says, As it is written, again pointing back to, I believe, this same psalm we just read, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, there is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are, all, they are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues... They have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. These are the people that the Lord came for. When he sat in heaven and looked down upon the children of men, he saw exactly this. He saw those that were full of deceit. He saw those that were swift to shed blood. He saw the unprofitable. He saw people that could do nothing for him. He saw people that could do nothing to even glorify him. He saw the lowest of the law. He saw the wretch. He saw a wretch like me. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 15, the Bible says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. The Apostle Paul here, they're naming himself as the chiefest of sinners. And those that Christ indeed had come for was the sinners themselves. In Revelation 21, the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers and sorcerers and all idolaters are grouped into those that will have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. And those are even the ones that Christ came for. Well, those are all really bad things, we might say. Those are all really bad people. Those are all really bad acts. But that verse rounds itself out and puts that great equalizer in there where it says, And all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. Who did Jesus Christ come for? He came for, as it says in Romans chapter 3, down in verse 23, That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Christ Jesus came for all the short. Not just in stature, of course, not those that are short in stature, but those that are short of the glory of God the Father. Those that are short of glorifying Him are those that Christ came for, the sinners. Why did Christ come down? Well, indeed we see that God in heaven looked down upon the children of men, and as it says in verse 25, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation. God set forth Jesus Christ to be that propitiation for the people that he looked down upon, for the sinner, for the unrighteous, for the unprofitable, for the unbeliever. God sent forth the propitiation, and that propitiation was Jesus Christ himself. As we see in verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's everybody. That's all of us. And while God saw that all have sinned and come short of his wonderful glory, God wants Nothing more for you than that you would be justified. And not just me, but every sinner worldwide. But we know that a just judge cannot just let people off with their murders. Cannot just let people get away with their sorceries, their abominations, the sins and wickedness that he has been had against him. Essentially that when people sin against him, the righteous judge can't just say, Ah, oh, you're free. Ah, oh, you can run free. It's okay. Rather... He must, he must, he must, in order to be just, he must enact justice. Continue reading in Romans chapter 3 and down to verse 24. Being justified, that's what someone needs to do to stand before God, clean. They must be justified here, it is freely by his grace, 
through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith, faith in his blood, that's Jesus' blood, to declare his righteousness, again Jesus, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, and I believe a change made, now we're talking about God the Father, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of them that believe on Jesus Christ. So you must be justified freely by his grace. And it's through faith in the blood of Jesus Christ that God might show forth his righteousness that he could be just and the justifier of them that what believe on Jesus Christ. You can't be a just justifier unless the debt is paid. You can't be a righteous judge unless you enact judgment righteously. That's why God had to send forth Jesus Christ to be that propitiation. That's why Jesus even came was order that he might be the substitute that would take upon all men the sins of the world in order that when God judged the sinner, he would be just in judging that person in that case because Jesus became the, the, the blood sacrifice. He became the propitiation. We see here then that God is both just and the justifier, and the only way that he could do that was through Christ. And this is why Christ came. As God set him forth, he obeyed and went to be that propitiation, to be that substitution for the sinner. How does Jesus save? As in like figure of the Passover lamb, as in that picture that we see in the Old Testament, as the death angel approached the, uh, the city, the call came out from God, the message, the word of God came forth that said, whosoever house chooses to obey God in preparing a spotless lamb without blemish and in slaying the lamb at the appropriate time and placing the blood upon the doorpost with lentil, whosoever would believe the word of God and carry out this command would have the death angel pass over them. And that same figure was the way that Jesus Christ saved the world, with the applied blood in obedience to God's command. The Passover was the uh, act that was shown in the Old Testament to the Egyptians, or that they could see the coming of the Messiah. This was a promise of God, and this promise would come true, but first of all, they were to believe God's word, and they were to act upon what God said. Now we know that this is only a figure for that time to come. And that figure shows that the righteousness of God or the protection of God through his righteousness can be applied to somebody if they would only believe and obey what God is commanding and what God sets forth as the means by which they can achieve that salvation, which they can receive that salvation. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9, this continues. It says, Hebrews 9 and verse 9, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifice that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertained to conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinance imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ, the Bible continues, so we see then that something like an Old Testament figure, a sacrifice, whether it be the Passover, whether it be the sin offerings, were set forth as a figure for that present time, recognizing that the service could not be perfected pertaining to the conscience. Recognizing that until the time of Reformation came in, these meats and drinks and diverse washings could never take away sins. The Bible says... In verse 11, but Christ being come a high priest of good things to come. But Jesus, you can say, who, who is God in the flesh, according to John chapter 1. But Jesus, who he himself preached, was equal with God in John chapter 5. But Jesus Christ, who confirmed his preexistence prior to his time he spent on earth in John 6, 62. Jesus, who assumed divine authority over the Sabbath in Mark 2 and over the forgiveness and sins in the same. Jesus, who assumed divine authority over the eternal destinies of all mankind in John chapter 8. Jesus, who exercised his divine authority over devils and over diseases and over the natural world. Jesus Christ himself, who both received praise in John chapter 20 and answered prayer 
in John chapter 14. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, has a different thing to set forth. Something likened to the time of Reformation. Something likened to a perfect service. Something that would cleanse somebody as pertained to the conscience. Jesus was set forth the Savior of the world without spot, without blemish, and he offered himself, not in type as we see in the Old Testament, building up to the days of Christ upon earth, not in type, but rather in truth. Jesus came. Look in Hebrews chapter 11. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having t obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So we see here that the blood of bulls and goats, it sanctifieth, yes indeed, to the purifying of the flesh, to the purifying of the carnal mind, to the setting aside of the sins in an act of repentance towards God and, and saying, I have sinned, bringing the offering necessary in order that your flesh would be sanctified, but for a time. But how much more, as it says in verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living and true God? Jesus Christ was without spot, and yet he was despised. Jesus Christ was without spot, and yet he was judged of men. He was condemned as guilty. He was spat upon, beaten, mocked. He... He was without spot, and yet not a bone of him was broken as he hung between heaven and earth. He was without spot, and yet he bore our sins in his body. He took them into eternity, and he left them there as far as the east is from the west. And though all that came upon him, Jesus Christ was without spot. And because he was without spot, he rose again, not only on this earth, to be a witness unto those chosen aforetime to see his resurrection, but he was a witness in heaven itself where he rose again. Look at verse 24. It says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus Christ entered into heaven itself. So how does Jesus save? He saves in that he offered himself for our sins, his blood for our sin debt, and he did it once and for all. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 25. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So Christ Jesus offered himself, and this was a once and for all sacrifice, never needed to be repeated again. Once and for all, Jesus Christ gave himself for the sins of the whole world. That brings me to the next question. Who does Jesus save? Yes, he gave himself for the sins of the whole world, but who does Jesus save? Verse 28 gives us a glimpse into this. It says, unto them that look for him. Now in Moses' day, Israel was plagued with serpents. And those are a picture or a type or a, a, a shadow of sins. So the plague on Israel was serpents or their sins. And Moses was commanded of God to raise a brazen serpent on a pole. And in the same breath, God told him, Every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. They were commanded to look and live. Look and live. They've been bitten by serpents. Look at the brazen serpent and live. Even so, if you look down to Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, the Bible says, For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ 
our Lord. And it's the same command today. Look to the Lamb of God. Look to the bread of life. Look to the Word made flesh. Look to the living water. Look to the light of the world. Look to Jesus who himself said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. So the wages of our sin is death. The serpent that bites us will lead us to death. But if we are to look toward the gift of God that is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, we shall be saved. The gift of God indeed is eternal life through the door that is Jesus Christ our Lord. So a gift, everybody knows, is not compensated for. A gift is not paid for by the recipient. A gift is not worked for by the recipient, but a gift is something that is simply freely received. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, that is what a gift is. It's something that is not by works, something that is not paid for and not received. But the gift we see is eternal life. And eternal is something then that never ends. Eternal is something that never fades away. Eternal is something that can't be lost. Eternal is something that is held in place by Jesus Christ himself and the Father. John chapter 10 says, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give, there's that gift there, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So would you try to get away from even Christ and somehow remove yourself from eternal life? There's the Father that's greater than all, even holding upon the hand of the person that is saved, who has received eternal life. That gift once received is eternal. That gift of eternal life, which is through Jesus Christ our Lord, is paid in full, and that never changes. That never Hallelujah. goes away. That is eternal. Settled in heaven, if you've believed on Christ once, if you were saved once, you were always saved, always and forever. Thank so we've seen that who, who Jesus came for, and that's for, that's for the sinners. That's for the all who have fallen short of the glory of God. We've seen then why Jesus came, and that's so that he could be the propitiation. He could be the sacrifice that is needed in order to appease the righteous judgment of the just judge who wanted to let the people free, who looked down upon the people that were fallen and in sin and suffering, he wanted to set them free and save them. That is why Jesus came, to be that sacrifice. How Jesus saves is simple, by faith in his blood, by believing on him, by trusting him to take you to heaven and nothing else. Not by works of righteousness, but according to his mercy, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So who does Jesus save? Well, the Bible says, whosoever will. Let him take of the water of life freely. Whosoever will is the answer to that question. Who does Jesus save? Whosoever will. Amen. Whoever desires to. Whoever wants to. Whoever is in need of. Whoever needs it, wants it, desires it. Whosoever will can take of the water of life freely. That's you. That's I. That's everybody who desires to be saved. Who desires to come to Christ and have him save them from their sins. The Bible is clear, and if you're to look in Romans chapter 10, just quickly, Romans chapter 10, that whosoever will is who's extended to. So does that mean that, again, everyone who desires it simply receives it? Well, yes, this is what happens. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Believing what you've heard in this short while, and in faith asking that it would be yours, is how someone enters into the kingdom of God. Believing what is heard in the testimony of Jesus Christ, in the spirit of prophecy, in the word of God. Believing what you've heard, and in faith asking that it be yours, is how somebody comes to be saved. 
The Bible says in verse 13 of that same, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's a promise settled in heaven. So if you understand who Jesus came for, and that's the sinner. If you understand why Jesus came, and that's in order that he could save those that were lost by giving of himself. If you understand how Jesus saves, and that's by grace through faith, plus nothing, minus nothing, believing on Christ 100% to get you to heaven, and you understand that it's just simply asking him, there's nothing stopping anyone who believes these things from calling upon the name of the Lord. Again, believing what you've heard and in faith asking that it be yours is the simple gospel message, the simple truth, the simple way of salvation that anyone in eternity has ever been saved. Amen.